Good morning, family. I bring to you greetings from your brothers and sisters from the church in Sitka. Got the blessing of being able to be there for um, about five days this last week. It's my first time going there. Uh, it was a tremendous time and um, got to meet some new brothers and sisters that I've never met before. And it's exciting to, to make those connections and we had a very positive experience there and hope to go back in the near future. We're going to be continuing our series this morning in the Sermon on the Mount. I believe this is our 10th lesson. And the title of this lesson today is Keep It Real. We're going to be in Matthew 6, 1 through 4, the passage that Brady just read for us. I spent a few years in South Africa working with missionaries there when I was in the Adventures and Missions program. And one of the things that we would do while working in that country is we would print off and collate this curriculum called Lessons to Live By that we would then take to public schools and we had this partnership with the school system where we would sometimes help teach but we would equip teachers to teach the Bible in the public school system in South Africa and once a week we would have this big printing day where we'd print all these papers and we put all these papers together and, and make all these big like 80 page packets that make hundreds of them and so we would spend hours collating and putting all these papers together once a week and me and my teammates while we were over there we would just be talking while putting all this together and one of my teammates and I uh, we had a great appreciation for Star Wars. And while we were putting these papers together, we would go on at length about how certain things would work. And we talked about like lightsabers and try to figure out, you know, does the blade of a lightsaber have any weight to it? Does, you know, how hard could you hit it before it would break? And we just talk about that on and on and on. And a running joke of our time there is one of the missionaries, Judy, she would hear us talking about these for minutes and minutes going on and on and on and she'd be listening in another room and then she'd come in we'd, we wouldn't see her and she would just listen and we'd go on and on and then she would just kind of lean forward and then just yell at us it's not real <laughs> and it just became a running joke on our time there whenever we were talking about something science fiction or whatever she would just blast us with it's not real and I think of, now, to put that on one side of our minds, there's things in life that are so real. Uh, a few years ago when we were working with some, of, um, some foster children, there, what, there's a little boy named Toto. I was out in this field with him, and he was just stomping on all these bumblebees. He would just find one. He would just stomp, find another one, stomp it. And I showed him, it's like, Toto, look. Look, man, they're not going to hurt you. You can, watch this, you can, you can pet them. And so we, we spent about three hours just rolling around in the field petting bumblebees. And I was thinking, this is real. This is real. When I put Unity to bed at night and I'm helping her know that God is good and that she's loved, I often think, this is real. This is real. When I'm spending time with my brothers and sisters in Sitka and getting connected to people, um, and in the name of God, I think this, this is real. When I'm listening to James talk about interacting with his family and recognizing what Jesus has done from us, that's, that's real. And so this lesson this morning is this idea of, of keep it real. We don't want to look good. We want to be good. We want to be with Jesus. We want to be genuine. We want to be authentic. We don't just want to have a reputation that appears pleasant, we want to be true. We want to be real. We can't just look good, we need to be good. And the only source of goodness is Christ. So we're in chapter six now, we've went through all of chapter five together, and so let's dive into it together. Jesus starts this teaching with saying, beware of practicing your righteousness before others in order to be seen by them for then you will have no reward for your, from your Father who is in heaven. So this passage starts out with a warning. In my mind, I hear Steve Irwin, the crocodile hunter, going, danger, danger, danger. And it's like, this is a warning. You gotta, there's a caution. And the caution here is that wanting to look good in people's eyes 
is a death sentence. You will have no reward from your Father in heaven if you're looking to look good in front of other people. I remember years ago there was this tobacco company that donated a million dollars to charity and then they spent seven million dollars advertising their giving to this charity. And it kind of displays what are their priorities. What are, what's their agenda in this action? And that type of attitude of I'm going to do this so that other people think and, and, and believe I am a good or, uh, and virtuous uh, person or entity. And some of you might be thinking that there's some conflict in this passage with what Jesus has said earlier. If you go back to chapter 5, um, verse uh, 16, Jesus is talking to us being salt and light of the world. And he says in verse 16, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. And so it's like, well, what is it? Are we supposed to do you doing good works that people see it? Or are we supposed to be not doing good things in front of people? And the big difference here is in this passage, you're trying to practice your righteousness versus you're trying to share the light that comes from Christ. There's a difference between trying to get people to think that you're good versus trying to be good in the world around you. So if you're trying to project your righteousness instead of share his righteousness is where things go horribly, horribly wrong. Now I want to make a big point about being thought as good by others is such a strong desire. The desire to have other people think that you're good is so powerful. It is not a small thing by any stretch of the imagination. It is a powerful, powerful thing. Peer pressure is so, uh, so strong. In fact, the only time we see an apostle, one of the twelve, stumble and sin after they receive the power of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost is due to the influences of, of a group, of a, of a form of peer pressure. We see it in Galatians 2, 11 through 14. We see Peter acting hypocritically um, in, when he was interacting with Christian Gentiles and then uh, Jews became part of that fellowship and then he withdrew from those Gentiles and in doing so was acting hypocritically and Paul had to rebuke him to his face and Paul, Peter stood condemned because of his actions in that way. And so I mentioned this just to highlight wanting to be viewed favorably by others around you is such a strong desire. It's not something to mess with, to scoff, to disregard. It's like, that's not that big of a problem, caring what other people think about you. But this is the only thing we've seen apostles stumble with. And I want to mention that just to highlight just how dangerous this type of temptation can be and why Jesus is saying in his fundamental teachings, beware of this type of um, environment because it's very possible for us to get wrapped up in this. I like Lord of the Rings a lot, and one of the things Bilbo Baggins ended up coining in that story is don't laugh at live dragons. And I think that there's some practical wisdom in that, in that recognizing social interactions, peer pressure, wanting to be accepted by the majority around you is a very, very powerful force. And to be flippant towards how powerful that is, is unwise. And recognizing how Peter stumbled with it here gives us insight that if Peter wrestled with this, it's probably possible we're going to wrestle with this too, of wanting to be accepted by those, as, and being thought as righteous and religious by those around us. So we don't laugh at live dragons. We don't make light of how Jesus is warning us of how serious it is that people are going to have opinions of us and we're going to want to value those opinions and we're going to look at how do we filter through that. We're going to go back to Matthew 6, back to our main passage here, verse 2. Jesus then goes on to say, thus when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets that they may be praised by others. 
Truly, I say to you, again, that key phrase of the Sermon on the Mount, I say to you, they have received their reward. Now, receiving a reward is a main theme in this passage. Jesus is going to talk about it multiple times, about what are you trying to, what are you going to receive from this type of lifestyle? And what's noteworthy here, as we see already from verse 1 and 2, they're not received, if, if you are trying to be acceptable by people around you, by your own actions, two really intense things are happening. One, you're receiving nothing from God. You will receive no reward from your Father in heaven. And what you are receiving is something not from God. Now, those two things are worth note, taking note of before we press on, that you will receive no reward from the Father if you're looking for other people to consider you righteous. That gives me pause. I hope that gives you pause as well. And they will receive the applause of man, and that's it. That's the reward. whoop de doo Is that worth it? Is that is getting the clap and the appraise and the pat on the back and the cheer of society, is that worth pursuing? And we're going to look at and see that that is such a shallow and insufficient reward uh, for our lives. Now, this phrase, they have received the reward, I hope you can hear almost the sarcasm and the ominous statement Jesus is saying with that. They have received their reward. What a reward it is. It is so insufficient compared to what God has in store for us. So there's a warning here. We don't advertise your goodness. We don't try to broadcast to the world, I'm a good person. Look how good I am. That type of thinking does not come from God. That's not a reward that comes from our Father. One form of this that's becoming really popular and prominent in our culture is this idea of, of virtue signaling, where you're trying to broadcast to the world and demonstrate to the world that you're a good person because you ascribe to this cause or this belief or you have this stance on this specific issue and you try to let people know through a watermark on your social media or a bumper sticker or a t-shirt or something. You're letting people know, hey, I'm a part of this idea, therefore I'm a virtuous person. Do you know what makes you a good person? Being a good person. And do you know how you become a good person? You follow Christ and try to be like him. Because he's the only good person. He's the only righteous one. We don't have any righteousness on our own. If you're wanting to be righteous, you've got to be like Jesus because he's the only source of righteousness. If you're trying to broadcast and convince the world that you're a good person, um, going about it wrong. The only way to be a good person is to be a good person. <laughs> not trying to convince the world that you're a good person. I'm not sure if there's ever been a time in human history when people are more concerned about what other people are thinking about them. I can't recall any time in history when people have been so consumed about their reputation in society. It's always been a strong desire, but it just seems off the scales right now. I wasn't planning on mentioning this today, but I just learned something this morning that I find so alarming. Did you know in the last 20 years, the suicide rates in this country have increased by over 30%? I find that stunning. 20 years, over 30% increase of suicide rates. And I know there's a lot of factors I don't completely understand to what would attribute to that, but a big part of it is not feeling accepted by the world around you. And the world's a horrible place. And if you're looking for the world to accept you, it's a terrible thing to accept you. It's a rough, it's a rough world. So what makes you a good person being good? And how do you be a good person is by following Jesus. So a big question is, what are you trying to do with your life? 
It's a big question you need to ask yourself. I need to ask myself. God has given you this life, this time, this moment. What are you trying to do with it? I want us to take us to this passage in Matthew 16. I'm going to show you a picture. A picture's worth a thousand words. And I realize if I have the right pictures up here, I can actually preach a lot more than what I can just say because I'm getting a lot more words out. So there's a picture I found in preparing for this lesson I found very impacting. And with this picture, I want to share this passage in Matthew 16, verse 25. Jesus says, For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. So this idea of what are you doing with your life? Because there's going to be real consequences to our choices with what we do with this thing God has given us, this time, this soul, this, this, this life. And we try to pursue so many things other than Christ, and anything other than Christ is an empty well. That when you're trying to pursue things to save, to hang on to your life, you actually end up losing everything. But when you let go of that life, and you lose yourself in Christ, you find everything. I've told some of you this story before about how to trap and catch monkeys. And there's these traps where they keep these, these almost like cantaloupe-sized um, balls, and inside of them, they're hollowed out with some nuts and candies and sweets. And there's just a, it's just a whole, it's the simplest trap. And the monkey, the baboons, will put their hands in this hole to grab the, the nuts and to grab these fruits, and then they'll make a fist. And then because they make a fist now, they won't let go of this uh, of these things that they've, they've hung on to. And the owners of the trap can just come up and just whack, kill the monkey, because they won't let go of just these little nuts and fruits. And if the thing just let go of these little things, it could be free and get away. But because they're hanging on to just these little things, they end up losing their life. And this idea of a clenched fist kills... I think is extraordinarily important on the subject. Where if you're trying to hang on to these things, you lose everything. But if you have an open hand to let go, that's the, also the same motion to receive of having an open hand. If I'm going to give this, I'm going to let this go, you're also now in a position to receive. But if you're trying to hang on to something, not only do you not actually get to keep that, you also lose everything. Um, now, what are, now that's, a, that's an analogy, but what are some of the things we actually try to hang on to that we commit our lives to that we actually lose our life in and we lose everything in? I'm going to give you some examples. One of them is acceptance, where we try to commit our lives to being accepted by the world and community around us. Loneliness is a horrible thing, and we try to find a healing to that by being accepted by those around us, even those that are not good. We are fearful of rejection, and therefore we pursue acceptance. We lose our, and we commit our lives to our occupation of trying to strive for excellence in your career, whether you're trying to be a doctor, or a policeman, or a preacher, or something, where you take your, your occupation and then you try to dump your whole life and lose your life into that. We pursue legacy of trying to leave a mark on the world and trying to make sure that what we do outlives our lifespan here. We pursue family and trying to find marriage and children in intimacy and community. We commit our lives to that. We pursue justice with trying to make things right in this world we put ourselves out looking for experiences. There's so much to do. There's so much to see. We want to travel. We want to experience it all. We can commit our lives trying to turn over every rock to see and explore an adventure. We also can commit our lives to just purpose of trying to join a cause bigger than ourselves. And, and in all these things, people put their whole lives into and in trying to hang on to their life and use their life and put it into those things, if it's not with Christ, it leads to losing everything. 
You see, what we're supposed to pursue is this abundant life. When you lose your life into this abundant life, something amazing happens. You let go of these things, and in doing so, you receive something not from this world, and in also that, you actually receive the fulfillment of all these other things. You cannot be more accepted than in the presence of God. Nothing separates you from the love of God. You cannot be more accepted than how God has accepted you. If you're looking for occupation, you were created in Christ Jesus for good works. If you're looking for legacy, being part of the body is of eternal significance as we build on a foundation uh, with gold and silver and precious things, things that last forever. There's nothing more um, potent to legacy than things that last for eternity. If you're looking for family, this is your true father. And who are your brothers and your sisters and your father and mother except for those who love the Lord? And the blood of Christ is thicker than the blood of family. If you're looking for justice, you're serving the only just one and the only one who can actually make things right. If you're looking for experience, there's no greater adventure than following the Spirit and being in step with the Spirit and living this life that he's provided. And if you're looking for purpose, you are created in the image of God. You are made and designed for this abundant life. So if you're trying to pursue these things in themselves, you're going to lose everything. If you look and lose yourself in this abundant life, you're going to find everything. You seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things are added to you. So what are you doing with your life that God's given you? Where are you putting it? Are you pursuing these things, or are you pursuing him? Because pursuing these things are, is a death sentence. Pursuing him is life. an abundant life. Don't try to look good, be good. And we keep it real. Jesus goes on to say in verse 3, but when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Character is who you are when no one's looking. Integrity is doing the right thing when no one is looking. We are to be people of integrity. We are to be people of a certain kind of character. It doesn't matter if there's no one around us or if there's a thousand people around us. We are to be of a genuine kind of person that is supposed to be like Jesus and has nothing to do with other people around us and their perceptions of us. When no one is looking... We're supposed to act just as consistent as when everyone is looking. Jesus has given you love, and it is our purpose to, when no one is looking, to share that love with people around us. Some of you are so good at this, of giving anonymously or giving in a, in a generous fashion, not looking to have any sort of public acknowledgement of it, and there's, over the years, I've been so inspired by sometimes being the middleman and connecting someone's generosity to, to others. There was this time, um, well, this makes me think of Romans 12, 10, which says, Let love one another with brotherly affection and outdo one another in showing honor. And this idea of, I love a healthy competition, but some of you have inspired me at times with of wanting to one-up each other and blessing and, and, and showing honor to people and thinking outside the box of how to do so. And I remember uh, when Jordan and David first came up here, they were part of our first mission team back in 2017. And they had just gotten here, and within a few days, um, people were calling, wanting to help out with them, getting their feet on the ground and getting the roots down to help us with encouraging the churches up here in Alaska and serving the community. And one person called me and says, I have a car. I want to give it to them. I was like, wow, that's super generous. Um, okay, we'll put that in motion. And then within an hour later, another person called and says, I have a car. I want to give it to them. I was like, well, somebody just beat you to it. Are you serious? <laughs> well, you know what? Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pay for their gas their whole time here. 
And just that spirit of, I, I want to bless, I want to give, and, and this outdo one another in showing honor um, is just inspiring. And, it, and I think of that often with, like, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. They had no idea, you know, they're all part of the body. They had no idea what the other person was doing, but they're just wanting to give, be generous, and then even outdo one another. And it's just, it's just so wonderful. It's so good. It's so healthy. It's so real. It's genuine. There's a lot of opportunities at this moment to practice this of being genuine, being generous, and not having to be trying to pursue reputation and to try to build up um, prestige amongst people. I know Tanya Garrett has a GoFundMe page to help with the transition of her life right now. I know that Landon's vehicle could use some repair because somebody, while he was with me in Sitka, he left his truck here when we went to the airport and somebody vandalized it this last week and sawed off his exhaust and messed up his Cadillac converter and a couple thousand dollars of damages to it. I know Ben Buchanan, the preacher in Eagle River, his vehicle died and he is in pretty desperate need of a vehicle. And we have a summer camp this July that's going to need a lot of different volunteers and help in different ways. Um, and in all those things and many others, you have an opportunity to be genuine in your generous giving, in, in, which can take all sorts of different forms. And I mention those things just as here's an opportunity uh, to love and to bless and to, to show honor. And it is part of just being real. It's part of living this life God has given us. So our last couple sections of passages here in Matthew 6, Jesus goes on to say, and your father who sees in secret will reward you. And I want to highlight here that this is your father we're talking about. This is my father that we're talking about. God is not karma. He's not a system that you just do good and the good happens. He's your father he has an expectation. He's a person. He's not just a system of balances that you try to appease or try to work to your favor. He is your father. He has an expectation on what we do with our lives. And in that expectation, he sees in secret. You can't hide from God. That is such an important statement. You cannot hide from God. He sees through everything. You cannot put on a facade. You cannot put on a mask. You cannot have any sort of barrier where God's like, what's going on down there? He sees everything, and that's really, really good. That is a very important fact that God sees and in secret. I realized very early in my life that I blush super easy, and I just turn red over all sorts of things. And I, for the longest time, really was frustrated about that, about myself. But I've come to realize and appreciate that, that I just realized I can't hide things very well. I'm not good at, at camouflaging and, and concealing what's going on in here. And what really helped me process and to become more thankful for that is when we were in South Africa, we were in Kruger National Park, and my I've, we found this pride of lions, and we were watching them. It was just so majestic and beautiful. And there was these two male lions on this rock about 60 yards away. I was just watching them taking pictures. And then out of nowhere, I didn't, we didn't know this. there was this lion part of the pride. There was a white lion. There was an albino lion part of this pride in the wild. And it jumped up on this rock, and it just was reflecting the sun. It was just like this like magical moment of seeing this lion in the wild. And I started researching and trying to understand, like, man, how can this thing live in the wild? And how do white lions work? And, and I learned some things about these white lions. And that lions are ambush predators. They hide in the golden grass and they sneak and, and they, they then pursue and pounce from a, from a place of, of blending into their environment. White lions can't hide, so they have to run faster, fight harder, and, and what I learned about them was that the inability to hide produces other strengths. And that resonated with me with realizing, don't hide who you are, don't try to blend in and pretend, be real, and in doing so, that's going to produce other strengths 
If we maintaining a facade takes so much maintenance. Your mask for society takes so much time and energy to keep up to trying to meet other people's expectations. If you just let all that go, you get so much more energy back. Pearls before swine type stuff. If you got something precious, this time and energy and emotion, if you're putting it all into trying to meet other people's expectations, you're going to, one, just be miserable, two, you're going to spiritually die. But when you are genuine, when you are real, when you, you then become bold, and I think of this passage in Proverbs 28, 1, the wicked flee when no one pursues, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. I think of this white lion of, I'm not going to hide, I'm not going to sneak, I'm not going to ambush, I'm going to be what I am. And what God has made you is to be bold, to represent his character in this world, not your own character. And so this idea of keep it real, don't try to blend in, be what Christ has called you to be. We are so terrified of potential rejection. And one of the great criticisms I've heard of our culture is many people in our society take out loans they can't afford to buy things they don't need to impress people that don't care. And we just spend our whole lives trying to put on a show for an evil world. Like, what are we doing? It's miserable. It's horrible. It's deadly. Why are suicide rates so high? Because we're trying to look cool to an evil world. There's a devouring that takes place in all of that. And Jesus is freeing us from all that for us to be, to be something, to be real. Jesus says, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. This reward our father gives us is not this like thing. It's not this, this one blessing. It's not this like niche superpower that we get to enjoy that just like we're all humans but we just get this one extra bonus thing by being Christians what he gives us is the ability to be something different this idea to be free to have a kind of life that's not in the world anywhere else I'm going to say something as a closing statement and I hope that you let it sink in to your core abundant life has nothing to do with what other people think about you Okay, I want that to sink in and let you free you. Abundant life has nothing to do with what other people think about you. What Christ provides, what he invites you into, has nothing to do with what other people think. And then when you live in that, you have a freedom that the world cannot touch or take. And it's in that freedom you step into this world and you represent something and the world looks at it and it's like so confused and can't control and they're going to reject it and at least the majority will. But it is an abundant life in what Jesus calls and invites us all into. So what I hope you take away this morning is Jesus is challenging and teaching us to not try to appease the world, not try to look good, but to be good. And we can be good if we follow the only one who is good, and that is Christ. So don't try to play pretend. Don't try to meet the world's expectations. Follow Christ. Be free. Have abundant life. And in that, you're going to find boldness, and you're going to find that the world, and trying to be trying to be acceptable to other people around you is a really strong desire, but there's so much freedom in life in letting that go. Um, On the point of like persecution, I always am convicted about Jesus was crucified, Paul was stoned, you and I might not get invited to somebody's birthday party. And we have such a fear of rejection and it's a very cultural strong uh, thread in our society right now And just let that go. 
and know that you have acceptance in Christ, you have belonging and purpose in his church, that you have a legacy of being part of the kingdom of God, and that there is justice in the presence of God, and that there's purpose in losing your life in Christ, because that's where we belong. And so it's in all of that that I hope that you embrace these teachings of Jesus and apply them to your lives all the days that God gives you. With that in mind, let's stand and sing this next song. Softly and...